further ado, it seems like the uh, requests to enter have slowed down a bit. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to Vanbug, the first Vanbug of the new year. Um, we're going to go over some of announcements and then we're going to introduce our student speaker and then have our, our featured talk with Saba Lasan today and then we'll have a post talk uh, Q&A um, from noon to uh, noon 30 uh, or up until one if, if sub is available. Um, Venbog is sponsored by the Bioinformatics um, Graduate Program at UBC and Simon Fraser um, in Vancouver and Burnaby, British Columbia. Um, also by Genome BC, celebrating 20 years, um, in addition to Ecoscope at UBC. And this is our Lightning Talks competition that just happened. Um, we're also sponsored by Bioinformatics.ca, um, which has a career board for Bioinformatics positions in Canada. Abcelera, uh, a local uh, biotech company at based in UBC. I'm sorry, based in Vancouver. We're now also sponsored by Langara, Stem Cell, and we're also affiliated with the three, two other Monbug and Torbug bug groups um, in Canada, as well as ISCB. Um, without further ado. We'll have our introductory student talk by Denisa Vasileva at the um, Daily Lab at UBC. Um, they will be talking about the development of novel epigenetic age predictors using targeted methylation sequencing data. Um, <laughs> thank you, Saba, for the cheers. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen and let you talk. So uh, we're going to be moving on to our, our feature talk for today. Um, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Saba Lassan, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the Scripps Research Institute. Um, Dr. Lassan um, is researching under Dr. Andrew Sue and Dr. Don Eastman. Um, they completed their bachelor's in biology, chemistry, and environmental and sustainability studies at the University of Utah, and they followed it up with a master's in biochemistry at the University of New Hampshire and lastly, a PhD in quantitative and systems biology at the University of California, Merced. Uh, when not being a scientist, um, Dr. Lassan enjoys long walks on the beach, skateboarding, and figuring out how to be a slightly kinder person than the previous day. Um, if everyone could please welcome Dr. Salva Lassan. I'm going to stop sharing and, and let them share their screen. You could unmute yourself. That would be great. There we go. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me. Uh, I am going to go ahead and put the slides directly here in the chat, and I will have the chat open so people can just go ahead and follow along that way if they uh, would like to look at them directly. There'll be some moments where I'll be uh, referring to certain links, so that's an easy way you can click on those links as they come up. Um, so yeah, so today I'm going to be talking mainly about Wikidata and my research as a postdoctoral fellow uh, and lecturer at Scripps Research. So I'm, I guess, in the start of my third year, I guess halfway, I don't even know what year it is, uh, through my postdoc uh, position at Scripps, and it's been great so far. And just talking to you all uh, about how um, we can, how we go about bioinformatics through the Wikidata Knowledge Base Network and my project. So just starting with acknowledgments and thanks from the start. And uh, so this is my funding resources, as well mentioned, Dr. Andrew Sue and Donna Eastman are my PIs, uh, the people that I work with and collaborate with. And thanks, Will, for the invitation, Van Bug, uh, for having me here. It's great. It's an honor to be a bioinformatics speaker today and one of the first for 20, uh, 2022. So also, yeah, followed by a really great student talk. Really, really great. And I uh, just wanted to give a land acknowledgement. So I'm located in San Diego, which is actually Pumier territory. And there's some links there if people would like to learn more about that. So first, what is bioinformatics? Uh, I just want to do a little check-in. I know people are pretty much versed in this audience with bioinformatics, but if you can go ahead and click this link here in the slide, you can access that link and just type in your response as one word. And I'm going to be following your responses on the other side here. So go ahead and click on that link. If you need that link, uh, I can go ahead and copy and paste that directly as well. Yes, thank you for doing that and I will be able to see your responses live. I 
I don't see any responses yet, but maybe are people having trouble typing in a word? Um, I am trying to put in one. It says web voting has not been turned on. Let, let me try it's again. Letting me uh, go ahead and click it again and try one more time. Maybe I need to reactivate it. Okay, it should be working now. Try that. I find I'm still not able to submit a response. Let me see. Okay, maybe. Oh, I see that. I see it's not. Huh. Well, this usually this, this usually is not a problem. Maybe people would put it in the chat if they're interested. In yeah, yeah. It. People don't mind just going ahead and putting it. You, it usually what happens is uh, it will form a word cloud and people can just see live there. Oh, let's try this. Okay, sorry. Try one more time. No, it's still it's still giving a hard time, isn't it? Sorry about that. Yeah, let's just have people go ahead and put in the in the chat what they what they how they would define bioinformatics as one word. Code. Chaos. Genomics. Data. Yeah, just kind of the first thing that comes to mind. And then, you know, maybe I'll make a word cloud out of this later. Uh, but but the, the, the bottom line is that people have kind of a different view uh, and there's overlap of that right of how we define bioinformatics if we were to define it as one word. And every time I ask people this question, you know, that cloud looks a little bit different depending on the audience. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the calibrator for where we're all coming from today with this question. And so we, as we all know, I think uh, maybe preaching to the choir a little bit here, uh, bioinformatics is not going to go anywhere. If anything, more and more, it will be kind of a requirement of people learning biology or doing any sort of life sciences. They will need to uh, take on some sort of coding skills or programming skills uh, or computational, some understanding, basic understanding of computational biology as they are pursuing their research. And so just a search here uh, shows through the web of science. So I did this uh, yesterday, a day before, just look for the term bioinformatics. And these are all the articles and reviews that popped up. So over 100, about 150,000. I don't know what's going on with this year. I guess they switched web of science, made a mistake here with 2006 and 2007. But uh, you can see where the human genome popped up and the human gut microbiome popped up. And it's just going up and up and up since then. And you know there might be some new terms and term, uh, changes to that terminology, but it's, it's going to be around, right? So where does... Where does uh, Wikidata fit, and what are what uh, what's my goal today, and what I'm wanting to relay in this talk? So first, introduce you to Wikidata and why accessibility matters. So Wikidata is open access. All the research I do in this position is open access. And why is that why is that important? Not just in terms of the community, but also for the success, success and longevity of our own research. Uh, second, sharing my own role and the research I do and my process in getting here. And, um, you know, I, I realize this is maybe a bit more broad than some of the talks you uh, usually get, but I feel like that's pretty important to me anytime I've gotten those talks as a grad student. So I'm trying to come from that same angle today, and I'm happy to go more in detail on the research, too, if you have questions on those. And then kind of last, you know, I'm not entirely sure. I, I, I'm assuming people are at different stages in terms of graduate studies, uh, but just kind of convincing everybody wherever you're at, maybe you're at an impasse with your research and feeling frustrated, especially maybe for those people, uh, just kind of convincing you all that uh, anyone can do this, uh, whether or not you consider yourself someone that's in bioinformatics. And I definitely, um, and still, I'm still, and I'm, even though I did quantitative systems biology, still trying to wrap my head around the idea that this is what I do now for a living. Uh, yes, and, and that it's, it's a valuable thing for people to just keep doing as we go forward. And so starting with what is Wikidata? So I'm, I'm gonna make a broad assumption here that probably most people don't know what Wikidata is or have, haven't heard of it before, but people I'm sure probably have heard of Wikipedia, right? So we can think of uh, Wikidata as the text version of Wikipedia and Wikipedia is almost like the Word doc. So uh, Wikidata is like the, the Excel spreadsheet and Wikipedia is like the Google doc. And you can click on this link here and it can take you to the main page and kind of give you an introductory, but this is under the umbrella of the Wikimedia Foundation. 
And specifically, uh, Wikidata is a knowledge graph database of everything. And so this uh, was from, I think, February, the last time I gave a, a talk or uh, with kind of these topics, or it was in February 2021. And, and so first, you know, kind of what is a knowledge graph? So this term knowledge graph database, what does that mean? A lot of what we do uh, is relational databases, and maybe people already know this. And now in the last 10 years or so, we've been moving more and more towards knowledge graph databases. So what does that mean? Uh, what is a knowledge graph? We can basically think of these as networks. So uh, relational databases, you can think almost like spreadsheets or tables and knowledge graphs are a bit more dynamic and heterogeneous. And in the context of this talk, I'm gonna be talking about relations to uh, biomedical entities. So you have um, genes and diseases and the relationships between them. So a relationship would be an edge and then that entity itself would be a node. So gene would be a node, disease would be a node. And this will come into play of, of my project that I'm talking about later. But basically, Wikidata acts as a knowledge graph database where we can uh, we have more relationships going on between nodes that, uh, that are otherwise maybe not as easy to connect. And that also allows us to explore more complex questions that also involves more complexity. Um, and if you want to read more on this, you can you can check that out too. And so, okay, this is a database that's constantly being updated. And so that is, uh, actually, let me quickly just notice something. Um, this is a database that's constantly being updated. And um, the last time that I gave a talk on this topic was May, 2021. And then before that was February, 2021. So you can see these numbers here about nine, 92.5 million items and then this was updated again 93.5 and then yesterday I took a screenshot of and this is the same main page 96.5 uh, million so these are all just community based really and and you do have researchers too that are uh, kind of uploading their data into this bigger database but a lot of this is just people that are really enthusiastic and it's it's quite accurate as well so the the probability the percentage of people who kind of um, in, uh, go about sp spreading or creating like fake news, so to speak, is like very, very low. And people, a lot of people in the Wikidata community, just out of their own personal interest, will go very quickly and address and resolve this. So it's, it's a really uh, powerful thing and testament that, you know, if you give people the opportunity um, to kind of be involved in the, these processes, they, they will step up to that and they're excited to get involved in almost as an expanded um, lab group in a way. And so again, Wiki, Wikidata is a structured version of Wikipedia. So how did this start? So in 2001, Wikipedia started. Uh, then 2008, Gene Wiki came about. And you can click on this link here that will take you directly to the paper, the, the ones that are in blue. And so then in 2012, uh, Wikidata was formally released. So Gene Wiki was actually kind of the starter for Wikidata. And now Wikidata has all sorts of information from celebrities to dinosaurs uh, to like names of famous sheep. Uh, but but there's a lot in, involved in terms of Gene Wiki, and I'll talk a little bit about that, or that's kind of where it started. And so text is to Wikipedia, what data is to Wikidata, and today there's over 300 languages, so dominantly English is there, but there's also Mandarin, um, Russian, there's all sorts of languages. Anyone can edit this, and this is advantage advantageous for biologists, uh, as we describe in this paper, and that's kind of the, the premise or the, the foundation of what I'm going to be talking about with my project, and this is also open access. And here's a little nice kind of word cloud, or I guess bubble uh, diagram made by one person in our Gene Wiki team of who really uses Wikidata a lot. So right now it's Leeds University Library is the biggest user, but there's a lot of different users and institutes. And maybe UBC or, or Vancouver will be uh, more, more involved in that. And so why use it? Uh, maybe, I, I'm assuming maybe people have heard of NCBI or have, have been, have tried it out at some point. So you can think of Wikidata as almost an expansion of NCBI where you have these very specialized biomedical databases and Wikidata is almost like the Google of uh, NCBI where you, you know, you might have multiple specialized databases like NCBI, ClinGen, ClinVar, et cetera, uh, where you can compile all the information from these specialized databases into one. And so, you know, you have some downsides that you might have more noise, but you also have more opportunity to connect. And again, that's going back to that knowledge graph database I was talking about where you have more opportunity to connect 
things and, and, and see relationships where you that might not be possible because a database might be too specialized. And because it is something that's curatable for everybody, by everybody, there's always new ways that we're seeing of how to connect things. And I will talk a little bit about that in, in the work that I've been doing too, and, and how that's also brought on some obstacles and how we overcome that. Uh, and the data infrastructure is always already there. So it's, it's quite straightforward for biologists or really anybody to just go ahead and upload. Uh, you don't need to do too much back end stuff. You can just take your data, your spreadsheet or whatever, and then just you know put, put it in there and it, it will automatically uh, fit within that format if you go through the instructions. And anybody can make a user account. Here again is the link. Okay, so one example I wanted to show is, I don't know if people have used the iNaturalist app. I really encourage people to try it out if you haven't already. It's a great way to identify things. If you see something weird, a uh, plant, animal, whatever, you can just upload the picture directly and they can identify it for you. Uh, I actually did it once when someone um, get, gave me some, I'm in San Diego, so someone gave me some tuna and I was a little suspicious of what kind of tuna it was. And then I did a reverse search and it was actually bluefin tuna, which they shouldn't be catching. So, uh, you know, you can do it for all sorts of stuff, but it's a free app to the public and it's really fun. Um, biologists also use this. So I, in my PhD work, I worked on venom microbiomes, which I'll briefly talk about, but mainly in the system of California cone snail, California conus californicus. And so here is the range. And when I was starting my research as a PhD student, you know, I, I had the system in mind and I wanted to know where do, where, where do I collect these animals? Because a lot of the information was anecdotal and I used iNaturalist as a way to just see the map. And this is all mainly based on the public's uh, curation of this. So these are people, just people that are interested in, you know, looking at going to the beach and they upload a picture. And so that really helped me see, okay, here's where you have high density populations and here's where these are going to be reflective of my collections and my studies for then, you know, uh, doing statistical analysis and things like that, that I'm being reflective of the population versus anecdotal information. And so, yeah, so this was my, my PhD work and I used this to then find these animals and we actually had a project that was um, uh, resulted out of some of that work. And that's now being uh, submitted, they're in the process of being submitted now. And you can read more about this relationship uh, here. If you click on this article, cross-pollination, so to speak, between iNaturalist and Wikimedia. And if you scroll down, um, there's some editable, oops, there's some editable code. Let's see. So here's a table. I think this was produced out of some edit. Here we go. So we mainly use Sparkle quite a bit. And then you can go to this code directly, view raw. And here's that code and you can play around with it. So I encourage people to check this out. Uh, you can think of Sparkle as basically our way of setting up a Google search engine, but through Wikidata. And anybody can, can play around with that and look for things that they're interested in. Maybe it's not uh, plants and animals. Maybe it's genes. Maybe it's COVID, what, what have you. Okay, and then kind of switching gears a little bit. So that's the overview of, you know, what is Wikidata? Uh, why use Wikidata? And now switching a little bit over to why does accessibility in science matter? So I feel with younger audiences, this is pretty much a given, but just to kind of reinforce, um, you know, we have these conversations all the time now about diversity, inclusion, equity, and access, and people are like, yeah, 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 like that's cool. Uh, but actually, there's a lot, you know, it, besides it just being the right thing to do and, and being having integrity as a person, uh, it also does result in better problem solving. So this is actually through Forbes, and they were looking at uh, the productivity of business teams, so not related to science at all, and they just focused on gender age and geographic diversity in a team and they showed that you have about 87 percent of uh, better decision making the more diverse your team is and when you think about that that makes sense right we collaborate as scientists a lot because we're trying to get inform we can't learn everything we're trying to get information from other people that they might know and and we're going to have a better way of, of coming to an, a solution to that question if we include people from other disciplines than if it's just us in this you know kind of narrow uh, view. So if you expand that to DEIA, uh, similar concept, right? So, you know, it's not only about being a good person, which hopefully people are interested in, but also about having better solutions to your science. And uh, there are some articles here of specifically why a diversity in STEM is really important, uh, both in the Scientific American article and this Nature article. 
And we also do this as a part of our research. And there is this uh, term FAIR that is actually published in Nature from 2016. And you can click on that for the paper. Uh, and that, and we do that with our project with Wikidata, where we make sure that all of our research is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And one easy way to see this is, for example, all of my work is very transparent through my GitHub. You can go to my GitHub and you can see everything, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. And when I was a PhD student, I, you know, I was pretty closed about my, my projects and I had them as like private repos. And then I talked to some people that had theirs as public and they're like, no, it's great because you know, you can have people comment and edit it. And I was like, I don't know about that. Like, I don't want to get scooped. And also I'm self-conscious about my research and things like that. And I still am. Uh, but but since doing that, and since our, our lab does that, I actually, there, there are total strangers that comment on my uh, projects, and they're very helpful. And, and the majority of the time, it's just people that want to help, and, and they have a solution to something uh, that I didn't think of before. And so it's really enhanced the quality of my work to just be open. So uh, I know it's a little bit scary sometimes. I don't know where people are at with how comfortable they are with doing everything that they do open on the open, but um, it's something that I, I feel has, and as I do it more and more, it's been really useful. And, it, and it's really in the name of, you know, having a better science, right? And, and having uh, your work just be improved through the community. And so, you know, thinking of these questions in your own research of how you can be more fair, uh, who do you include, who do you exclude intentionally or not, uh, you know, I think we all are assuming that we're, we're, we're in our day to day, we're trying to do our best and, and be good people and just live our lives. Uh, but uh, here's, here's a, and it's not an end all be all, but here's a nice link of some ways to kind of catch our own implicit bias. And it's stuff that I do to kind of check on myself all the time. And, and it's nice to see kind of uh, the evolution of the site as well over time. I think when they first started the project, it was just um, looking at bias and gender and race and now it's expanded to religion and orientation, all sorts of things. So just thinking of different ways and, and also, you know, keeping myself in check as I become more senior as a scientist of thinking different ways of representation I didn't consider uh, when I first started. So, you know, it's just good ways to check and then think of, okay, how can I also then include these perspectives in my research to make sure that I am thinking about different things because different people think of things in different ways. And that also ultimately helps with um, coming up with good solutions to your science. So hopefully at this point, you have a general understanding of what Wikidata is, why you might want to use it or start an account to just get yourself familiar with it uh, in your own research and kind of extending that into why uh, accessibility and representation and thinking about these things and how you conduct your own research is important. And so now I'm going to switch into specifically kind of my project and my path to um, getting to where I'm at now. And then I'll wrap up with um, talking a little bit about bioinformatics generally, which might be a little repetitive for this audience, but um, hopefully it gives you a little bit of a nice little motivation boost for the end, a little happy ending. And so my research, so I referenced before GeneWiki started in 2008. So that's what we do as a GeneWiki project. And uh, here are some links on, on what you can uh, learn more about on your own. The YouTube link is actually me going over, I did a, a workshop, I taught a workshop for the International Society of Biocuration, I think it was October of 2021 or 2020, I forget, I don't know what year it is, it's I think it was 2020, but uh, yeah, you can click on that and that just goes over, you know, what I, uh, how I went through making a automated bot to integrate data between uh, ClinGen, which they have, it's a database that has Clin, uh, gene and disease relationships in humans and automating that process from start to finish uh, into what we now have as a scheduled bot that that takes the data from ClinGen into Wikidata. And that's a lot of uh, kind of what I what I do on a day-to-day -day and just kind of addressing those. And so that walks you through the process of if you want to upload or figure out how to do that for your own work, um, you can check that video out and, and apply it to your stuff. And so basically what I do is uh, applied in biomedical, which is a little bit of a shift from what I've done before. Uh, lots of learning, but all in good ways. And again, here's this paper. So this is just overviewing Wikidata itself as a knowledge graph and how we have um, used it as a tool for our research. And so specifically with the project I do, uh, this was done by a grad student that's now moved on, uh, Michael Meyer. So this was his project. And so he basically put together uh, this 
this uh, repurposing analysis where we looked at drugs that are already FDA approved and we tried to see, or maybe are not in use anymore, but are already FDA approved, tried to see how they might be useful for something else, another, a different disease based off of this network, this knowledge graph network. And we paired that with uh, the algorithm from Project Rofedio. And so what this is basically showing us is performance, and we can see that uh, over time, and the, the analysis itself is the same, um, and then over time you can see that the performance improves, and so this is namely a result of just community curation and that there's just more information in Wikidata, in Wikidata which improves the performance. And these papers also give more information on um, the details of that, and you can see the actual code itself at the bottom of that GitHub link. And so again, yeah, so this is log uh, logistic regression. And so it's working through, uh, it, it was, it originally comes from Project Repetio and was focused on uh, the, this graph uh, HetNet. And so you can look at that there again, if you click on that link for those details. Uh, Wikidata is another heter heterogeneous network. So we applied the algorithm from uh, the Project Refedio to Wikidata seemed similar enough. And then uh, Mike, he has this bioarchive, which actually might be published now for double check. But uh, he had the, another uh, network that he produced kind of from this work, uh, Mech Repo Net, and you can check that out as well. So now we're kind of in the process of comparing the different uh, types of analyses and also the different types of networks, Wikidata being one of them, rep Mech Repo Net, and then HetNet is another. And so again, this is coming back to what is a knowledge graph and you know that the advantage of knowledge graph databases is you can kind of address or, or explore these more complicated uh, questions than you would be able to do with a relation, typical relational knowledge graph, uh, relational database. So this is where my project is at, or basically, so, so Mike has moved on. And so I've been in the process of, of taking on this and reproducing the analysis. Uh, not just from the previous years, but also from kind of 2019 to present and showing, you know, does this continue? Do we continue to see uh, uh, improvement in the performance over time? Is there a limit to that? What are some of the caveats and setbacks? And this is also dependent right now on our funding. So we don't know what's going to happen with our funding. Hopefully all is well and everything's fine. You know, if people are familiar with this, but we'll know about that in the next couple of months. Uh, but just kind of going forward with that, and uh, right, I'll just talk a little bit about that pipeline and kind of the obstacles that we've encountered, and then the rest of that is smooth sailing more or less afterwards. Uh, you know, there's always a bottleneck in every project, and, and this is the bottleneck. But kind of getting back to the, the main thing of why using Wikidata, so there's a lot of power in crowdsourcing, and so this is really showing us that, uh, that we... It, this is a really useful tool or this Wikidata resource is a really useful tool for improving our ability to find potential candidates uh, for what we're interested in, which is for drug repurposing than in other networks. Okay, and so the project pipeline, so you can see, uh, so you can see the uh, repo here. Uh, just seeing a quick question here. How do you define a correctly repurposed drug? Uh, that's a great question. I will get to that maybe a little later. So thanks, Juliana, for that. And so here, the general pipeline is first just reproducing the analysis. So this is something I've actually been doing for almost a year and it just takes a lot of time. Uh, you know, I don't know, probably the joke you all can maybe agree is when you're working with code that's already around, uh, depending on what's going on and you know what packages have been updated and things like that, that I feel is 90% of the work is just reproducing that. And then once you reproduce it, then you're like, okay, now you're just actually doing the results and the analysis. So that's that's what's taking the majority of the work. And, and I feel like I'm pretty sure the choir here. But the tools we really use are, are you know, like anybody else, Jupyter Notebook, GitHub, Python, Google, um, and, and just figuring out troubleshooting that way. Jenkins is what we use to automate, and then also AWS uh, from the previous years. And, and uh, then the next stages are just comparing. So once uh, I can get this to re reproduce, which I think we're pretty close, uh, reproduced and automated, then we're going to compare to other algorithms, compare to uh, other reinforcement learning algorithms, compare to other knowledge bases. So 
kind of refreshing a little bit. The main algorithm we're using is from Project Perfetio. Uh, the uh, the main knowledge base we're using is from uh, Wikidata, is Wikidata and establishing a user interface. So we want to have something that um, researchers can just access directly and upload their data and then see the results and interact with directly uh, versus having to go through Wikidata. So some sort of easy GUI for people to do. So that's the main things that I'm doing. Um, and then comparing to others. So, you know, we're using the one from Project Repetio, but there's other ones I'm looking at, like semi-type is another that I'm uh, potentially going to try. And then uh, another uh, other knowledge bases to compare would be Mac RepoNet and HetNet and see how that performs, how Wikidata performs. And an expansion or extension of this. So as I mentioned before, I did uh, venom microbiomes for my PhD work. And so how that comes into play here is, um, I, I I was really interested in venom microbiomes because there's actually only like a handful of venom microbiome studies at all uh, versus hundreds of thousands of microbiome studies. And yet there's like very venomous animals is, are very diverse. And so was their microbial biodiversity. And so that core can correspond potentially to a lot of uh, undiscovered drug candidates that we haven't yet looked at or explored. And so then wanting to extend the prediction of this analysis for drug repurposing to uh, uh, repurposable, repurposable drug candidates to also potential candidates that could be used as therapeutics derived from venom and, and venom microbes. And so, and then a question that came up, so that might be relevant to answer here. So how do you define a correctly repurposed drug? Uh, that's a good question. So, so we really just come up with a, a list of ranked candidates. So we have uh, all of these FDA approved drugs that we use from Drug Central as our kind of gold standard. And then what we do is uh, we have a ranking system. So the analysis outputs a ranking system based off of uh, how close a drug matches to these different paths. So going back to here. So right, this is quite simplified where I just have gene and disease, but you would also have the other node categories are things like anatomical structure, phenotype, protein pathways. Uh, and we're trying to kind of get a consensus at the moment if we want to do 10 node categories or 25 node categories and what those, how we're going to define those. Uh, and so, and of course, that and that entails more complexity. But basically, this network then outputs a ranking of a drug that is most likely to be treated with that pathway. So you can also think of this as just kind of a biochemical pathway, and you're testing each drug throughout Drug Central that's already been FDA approved as you know, based off of this network for this specific gene disease relationship and everything involved with all those other node categories, what compound might be the most useful for treating that based off of what's already known about that compound treating other diseases related to genes? I don't know if that properly answers your question, but basically we output a list and then we give that list to clinical researchers to then do follow-up validation studies. And we, we compare the accuracy of that uh, to other studies that are currently out there. Let me know if, if that answers your question or if you would like uh, some more detail, feel free to ask. Okay, and then thanks for that question too. And then current obstacles. So current obstacles being like, this is the last year that we've been troubleshooting this. Okay, great. Uh, so reproducing the analysis, you know, the, the main thing, so the code, code is great, right? Uh, what the issue is that we're encountering is that there's some different versions. And so we also have had some updates to Wikidata since then. And so what do we want to do? I mentioned we have different node categories we're trying to figure out and kind of come to a consensus on because we want to be able to have a clear way of like, okay, this is what we are deciding as a biomedical node category. And this is why, and this is how we're identifying it. And here are the identifiers we use. So that's taking, that takes a lot of time to come to a consensus. Uh, we mainly use Sparkle query, Sparkle querying and Sparkle. And so uh, the previous time that this was used, there was not, there was less information in Wikidata. So it's a good thing that there's even more in Wikidata now because that will hypothetically improve our analysis output. But it's a bad thing that we're realizing that there are certain categories like chemical compounds 
that we can't use this Sparkle query tool for anymore. So now we're using um, kind of RDF tools, so Wikibase, uh, Dump, and WDSub are some, and then there's actually a list of nine that we have now that we're trying. And it seems like we're really close. Um, so I just recently was able to get some uh, updates to this after you know months and months of troubleshooting, so that's exciting. But that's where we're at now. Um, and then just personal learning curve. So with my own path, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, you know, I'm a little bit of a baby when it comes to Python debugging and just uh, getting familiar with that logic. And I mean, I did R before, which is there's a lot of translation, but just really getting myself more familiar and immersed in bioinformatics and then also familiarity with deep learning algorithms and all the statistical assumptions assumed in that. Uh, and and bringing in so so you're probably all maybe more experts here than I am in in that being your focus because uh, I'm coming in more from a microbial ecology uh, background and so kind of bringing that those strengths in to then apply to uh, learning more technical skills of what I do now and just wanting to normalize that it's okay not to know things I just you know I am honored to be a speaker here and I hope that this gives people some comfort to know that you know you can be doing a project for a year or two years or something and still be learning and hopefully always be learning right because that's why we're scientists we just want to learn all the time uh, and so just I think it's really important to acknowledge the things that you don't know as a way for also helping you learn the things you need to know or where you want to get and having those open conversations with each other to find the solutions to your problems in your projects. And so just shifting a little bit. And again, I can go more in detail on the project uh, in the questions as well. So shifting a little bit now to uh, my path and one of many options. So I grew up as the eldest in an immigrant family, I have a really big family. This is maybe uh, 15, 20% of my family. So that's just some perspective there. So Pakistani on one side, Indian on the other side. And I feel like many immigrant families, uh, they want their kids to be doctors or engineers or lawyers or something. And I did not want to be a medical doctor. Uh, I didn't even really consider myself smart. I grew up in Utah and I I uh, was lucky enough to get, uh, my friend was, um, her brother was in, in grad school. And so I was, I was lucky enough for her to basically convince me to apply for this high school research program in 2007. So that's dating myself a little bit. Um, and that paid the same as a summer job that I was going to get at Nielsen's Frozen Custard, because who doesn't love frozen custard? Uh, but I didn't consider myself smart, and then my friend persuaded me to apply for this program because she didn't want to be in it by herself. She was pretty smart. And then I got into the program, and I was, like, very surprised, and it paid the same. So I was like, okay, well, I'll do this. And they offered me a job in a lab after, so that was really lucky and really great. And then I was able to get a scholarship. So uh, I only applied to two schools at the time. I didn't know about fee waivers or anything like that. Uh, so I grew up in a low-income household, and... I got a scholarship to University of Utah, and I also was admitted to Berkeley and got a scholarship there, but it was like way, way more money and, uh, you know, it was out of state fees and all of that. And so I initially felt some regret that, oh man, like I, I'm staying where I'm from, but if I can give any words of wisdom, I would say uh, in retrospect with my path, which was mentioned in the introduction, you know, a lot of it has been driven by financial decisions, and I don't regret any of that. I think that uh, you can really make the most of your situation wherever you are, and grad school especially has allowed me to see a lot of stuff and explore a lot. Of course, it's a little different now with COVID, but still, um, you know, I don't feel that if you're in a financial situation where you feel restricted or you're, you're not sure of making a decision, I just want to kind of reinforce that and say that, you know, do the most financially comfortable thing for you, and it will work out. Um, I don't have any regrets going to University of Utah instead of Berkeley. Uh, and then just kind of going on throughout with that. So I think throughout my journey, the most important thing has really been supportive mentors. So not necessarily that they are, you know, at a prestigious place or that I'm a prestigious place, but that they're just doing quality work, that they're nice people, uh, and that they're supportive of me and, and my interests. So when I was an undergrad, I worked with um, several really great people. Colleen Farmer, I did Ecology and Evolution. Uh, Randy Sheckman, I did RU. I ended up doing an RU at Berkeley, who is now a Nobel Laureate. Uh, I think it was a couple of years before he got the prize. Oh, so all these people are really, really nice as well. And then Baldomero Oliveira, who's who I worked with the majority of my undergrad. And I did a uh, constant biochemistry work with him and, and vesicle trafficking with Randy. 
Um, but they're all really great people and really sincere. And I think that made a huge difference. And then uh, I wanted to get some field work experience. I did a lot of molecular biology work uh, during undergrad, and it was just a lot of bench work. Uh, not just, it was, it was like thousands of PCRs or hundreds of PCRs. But uh, I, you know, the wet lab work was great, and I wanted to get more experience with field work and kind of more hands-on stuff. So I went to University of Hampshire, and I did biochemistry there. Where, but I was working with lampreys, so uh, we would collect the lampreys, and so that incorporated some field work uh, with my my bench work. And I also had some hobbies too, where um, I I did skateboarding and I did art and maybe too many hobbies, but you know, just just kind of keeping it fun. Um, and then I wanted to um, get some more quantitative work or computational work. I didn't know anything about R at all. Uh, I, people would like throw that word around and I did not know anything that they're talking about. I did my entire master's thesis uh, just through Excel. And so that's where I got, uh, I was just gonna go into the uh, biotech industry. And then one of my friends told me about this place, UC Merced. Um, I was a little fed up of, of academia as well and, and some negative experiences I had in the sciences. And so I was ready to just get a job and, and be done with it. And then my one friend told me about UC Merced, which was focused on, it's a Hispanic serving institution and focused on low income students and just a lot of things about UC Merced uh, spoke to me and my personal values. And so I, I just applied there, I got in, I, got a, I was lucky to get a fellowship. So that's where I completed my uh, PhD in quantitative and systems biology, started learning programming and incorporated that as part of my project. So my thesis was on venom microbiomes and kind of proposing this as an emerging uh, subfield within microbiomes and microbiology. Um, and so kind of melding microbiomes and venomics together. Um, and then just kind of, yeah, wrapping it in those different skills of wet lab, field work, and then quantitative and computational work as this whole uh, holistic view of tackling um, life science projects. And so this, if you check out this correspondence, we're now do, working on a follow-up review that we'll be submitting probably in the next couple of months of kind of a justification for why people should explore this field more. So at the time, like I mentioned, there was just a couple of studies and now uh, really happy that this has expanded quite a bit and hopefully will continue to expand because there's so many different kinds of venomous animals. And that also means there's a lot of uh, potential for discovery, specifically uh, natural product discovery and also microbial biodiversity discovery, which can help. Uh, one interesting finding from my PhD work was that um, the, the, uh, that was that the microbes in the venom of that cone snail I mentioned, uh, they seem, and this is from some proteomics and metabolomics where we did in tandem with um, kind of amplicon sequencing, but uh, it seemed that the microbes that were living in the venom are kind of acting as, they're, they were, they're potentially making uh, compounds that prevent biofouling in the venom kind of micro environment. So you can almost think of this as a way of potentially tackling, uh, tackling antibiotic resistant bugs, super bugs. So that was kind of an interesting discovery and that we are, that's something I'm, I'm kind of putting together now and that, you know, instead of just looking to microbes as a resource for natural products uh, and, and new compounds, maybe also seeing them as a tool to microbes, you know, as you think there's like probiotics uh, and taking probiotics. And of course, there's controversial opinions on that as well. And I have my own share of those. Uh, but, you know, thinking of microbes as a tool, as a, as a already evolved tool by nature for tackling these issues we have in hospitals for uh, right now, for example, with like uh, antibiotic superbugs. And so what led me to this position is I was mentioning, you know, I did this one piece that uh, was involved a lot of iNaturalist work. Uh, so when we were doing collections on the cone snail, uh, for my PhD, um, we also work with some museums to figure out where to collect the animals. And when we worked with these museums, it kind of made me realize that there was data we were working with that was over 100 years old. And there were so many questions I had for people from 1909, for example, that I just can't ask them because they're not around. 
Uh, but would have been really helpful to have that information available and we could have gotten even more out of that. Like we have all this stuff with climate change right now and temperature is actually one of the most consistent measurements we've had over the last hundred plus years. And so that's why it comes up a lot as well, right? Um, and of course, you know, people that do paleo work can talk more about that as well. But um, yeah, so, so that kind of got me thinking when I worked on that specific uh, part of my PhD work, that kind of got me thinking, well, I'm doing this research, you know, I'm putting out these papers. What about this work is going to be helpful for people, not just five years from now, but maybe 50 years from now or more? And how can I actually contribute to something, uh, if I can, that will be useful for people in the future long term? Because that, I feel, is going to be a pretty important. So that's what ultimately led me to this position because, you know, as I mentioned, Wikipedia has been around since 2001. I think it will be around for at least 10 plus more years, same with Google. So figuring out ways to get involved in that, and that's what led me to this position uh, with Andrew and Don at Scripps Research and doing Wikidata. So that's what I do now. Um, I also teach the Applied bio Bioinformatics course here for grad students and uh, have been involved with some uh, workshops as well. And so just kind of a take home too, I don't know where people are at in their own careers, but these are some of my previous mentors as well that have been really, really great. And there's a long list, very fortunate to have a long list of other people, some of the people I already showed. But I think if I could say anything, I know I've definitely been in situations where people uh, warned me about working with certain people and I just did it anyways because I didn't think it was going to be that big of a difference. Uh, it does make a difference. I think working with people that you want to uh, you know, do the kind of work that they're doing, but also you want to be the kind of people that they are in terms of their own character, I think is really, really important because you, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to go home and you're going to be alone with yourself and your thoughts. And, and I think it just makes the work more fun uh, and, and honestly more productive too when you're working with people that are just really great. So if I could give any uh, word of wisdom, so to speak, you know, if you're in a scenario where you're kind of struggling or you're you're working interacting with someone that um is maybe a little uh you're you're it's a little bit of a clash or something you know just just find people that are that are going to appreciate you uh, i think it will make a big difference and it will also help you um, be a, a really great scientist and leader going forward too so that uh is those are those two aims so introducing you to wikidata why to use it and as a scientist and then why accessibility is important sharing my own contributions to Wikidata through the Gene Wiki project and uh, this Wikidata repurposing portal with uh, repurposing, finding uh, repurposable drug candidates and then my path to getting there. And now just kind of briefly wrapping up and then opening the rest of the time for questions. I'm available till about uh, 1230, 1235. Uh, that, you know, anyone and everyone, I think, should uh, get involved in bioinformatics. And, you know, I think I'm speaking to the choir here. But uh, I appreciate the choir here, but maybe what you can take away from this is, you know, your families, right? I think for me, um, talking with your family is more about what you do and your friends. I think for me, you know, I'm pretty much the only scientist in my whole extended family. And I, I share, like, I shared this talk that I'm doing with them. Uh, I'm going to share the recording with them later. And, you know, they ask me questions. And I think just, just getting people more involved in that process, and, and, and some of them make Wikidata accounts and they try out stuff, uh, just really having it be kind of a community process and, and having people get excited about it, uh, especially, especially when it comes to bioinformatics, because it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. So, you know, again, this might be a bit repetitive, but just to reinforce, you know, why do bioinformatics? Uh, it's here to stay. It's going to be here for a while. And, uh, you know, maybe there'll be a crash on the internet. We don't know, but I think it's safe to say it's going to be here for a while. Uh, it's highly interdisciplinary and transferable. So now a lot of tech is getting involved and a lot of tech is also getting involved in making decisions and policy. So this whole thing about, you know, science not being political, I think it's going to continue to be very, very political. And uh, our involvement and understanding of um, how we're going about our science is also going to be really important for ethical questions as well as uh, technology and tech industry continues to uh, gain power and uh, say an agency in policy. Uh, and where and how to start. And so I, again, I don't know entirely where people are at if they're first years or if they're mid years or all over. But I think just anywhere is good. If you're wanting some point of reference, this uh, link will take you to a course uh, that I did again with grad students 
last year and it's completely or I guess yeah fall 2020 it's completely reproducible and, and you can follow it on your own uh, through just your own time everything is accessible if you have any questions let me know or suggestions and the main thing that might be of interest to people is you can reproduce analysis from papers that have already been put out um, through here unit C the capstone project. So you're going to reproduce those all through code. So that's some nice uh, troubleshooting there. And again, if you have any questions, just let me know. But there, there's one resource and there's plenty out there. It's not just mine. Uh, but yeah, YouTube and Wikidata. I really wish that I got a lot better with you using YouTube as a tool earlier in my life, but I'm here now. So uh, if people aren't using YouTube that much. I definitely recommend it. Learning a lot of stuff on troubleshooting that way. Practicing a lot, um, just with like writing for papers, I think for myself, I have full days that I just do coding and I don't really look at emails. I don't do anything else. I just do code. So I would really encourage people to do stuff like that. If you can dedicate, you know, four to five hours uh, in one day each week, if not, if you can't do that more, uh, where you can really, you know, get deep into the paint with stuff and, you know, just practicing and, and answering those own your own questions and also asking people too and getting comfortable with that. I think that's something I'm always going to be practicing of just how to just get familiar with saying like, I don't know how to do this, you know, and then people are, are mostly pretty friendly uh, and, and just continue to ask those questions. And you know, paying it forward. So, like I like I said before, you know, I think uh, at this stage, even if you think, oh, I'm just a grad student, you know, what what can I do? You know, people do look up to you, whether you realize it or not. Uh, I guess people like me enough to invite me to this talk, for example. So these are things I'm trying to think about. Of you know, whatever stage you're in, just trying to be the kind of colleague or mentor. Uh, or, you know, a person generally that you would want to work with and remembering that you're an example and, you know, being kind to yourself in that way too, that it's okay to not know everything. It's okay to be open. We're a community. We're all learning. And, and the more we can be open about that, the better our science is going to be because we're just being honest, right? And that's kind of the main pillar of being a good scientist is being honest and having that level of integrity with yourself as well. And okay, so that, that was a lot. Um, and so I just wanted to check in with people. I think there's a Zoom poll out if uh, Rihanna wouldn't mind sharing that of just kind of gauging. Uh, I hope the pace was okay as well. So go ahead and, and fill out your response. I'll, I'll keep it uh, for maybe 30 seconds and then we can close the poll and share that. And then if uh, we could share those results, if, if we've had enough people participate. Okay, great. Well, that's exciting too, to see that people are interested in Wikidata. So if you have more questions about Wikidata, uh, just let me know. And I wouldn't have been heard if anyone said less enthused. No, no offense taken. Uh, okay, great. And so with that, I'll just wrap up and uh, say, you know, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Thanks for having me again. And you can click to this link directly if you want to make a Wikidata account. And if you have any questions on how to approach that, feel free to ask me. My information is available. All right. Thank you so much, Salva. Um, does anyone have any, any questions right off the bat? Um, feel free to post in the chat or raise your hand and you can unmute yourself. Um, okay, so I guess I can start here. Um, so you mentioned that you like truly believe that like your talks like is accessible to like everyone, not, not just people in, in bioinformatics and, and, and I would, I'd like to understand a little bit about how you um, balance like giving a talk from the perspective of what interests yourself and also what you think will be like engaging or like what will contain something that a more general audience would like to like latch on to. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Will. Uh, well, like for example, you know, I sent you the slides of what I did before to kind of get an idea. So I just ask people a lot of the time. I, I really believe in the power of community feedback, and maybe I am too 
explicit with asking for input. Oh, I think Charlotte, um, I'm glad it was helpful. Uh, but yeah, maybe I, I'm too, I, I, one of the main things I get from my PIs when I get my evaluations is that I'm, I'm really good with constructive feedback. And, and sometimes they're like, you're asking us too much feedback. Just, you know, it's okay. Like we don't even give you feedback right now. So, so I think for me, I don't have any issue uh, with just asking people, hey, is this something that would be interesting to you? And, and that's something that I was also, I think, a really good exercise for myself as a scientist, because you know, we, when we're, especially as, as early career researchers, when we're grad students, when we're postdocs, we're so deep in our project, which is really good. Like you need to do that. Right. Uh, but, but sometimes it can really disconnect us from, um, you know, what might be relevant or what might be important. And, uh, and then we kind of get frustrated later on or we're like, wow, like I did all this work and like, it's like, oh, it feels old for not, right? Uh, so, so one comment I got from a mentor uh, early in my grad studies when I was doing my master's was, you know, oh, you know, just, uh, just put your head down and, you know, do your work and just focus. And then, you know, uh, you don't, don't, don't look at the news. Don't just, just do your work and, and get done. And, and, and then you'll just pop out of, you know, with a, with a PhD. And I remember hearing that advice and feeling that was terrible. So <laughs> I was just like, I don't agree with that advice at all. And, you know, imagine right now we're in a pandemic, right? So imagine if you did that, uh, you, you wouldn't even know what was going on. Right. And so it's, right now it's pretty important to keep up with stuff in the sense that, everyone in a way is a little calibrated in that everyone needs to be keeping up with news to a degree to know what's going on with the vaccines, what's going on with uh, social distancing, things like that. So, and this is something that if you come from an underrepresented background, for example, you have to kind of be alert on things all the time, depending on what your background is. Um, so, so kind of going back to your question of, you know, how to balance this stuff, right? Because you don't want to drive yourself crazy. You need to get some work done. You need to make progress. But at the same time, you know, you you want to, um, it, it is very helpful for your research as well in terms of that progress and, and, and getting that input at certain steps. So for me, I would say it's a balance of, you know, like I, I checked in with you of saying, okay, how much of this should I keep? How much should I take out? What are your thoughts? And, you know, you gave me some comments and I was like, okay, great. That's good to know. I'll update that. And I went a little more on, on some of the research stuff. And, you know, maybe I could have gone even deeper on the research um, that there's always room for, for more and more improvement. But I think just that general check-in, right? You have to draw the line somewhere. So for myself, you know, with talks, for example, I usually will ask a few people, hey, how does this look from your perspective? And some of those people are other scientists. Some of those people are not scientists. And then I just kind of take and see, okay, here's a balance, here's a story, because at some point, you know, you have to have some flow. And I don't know if I have that flow or not, but, um, you know, you have to draw a line somewhere and, and balance that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but just kind of, you know, taking in that feedback, taking that input, but then also still having it be yours, right? What feels good to you? What feels appropriate to you uh, in a way that pushes you a little bit, but also still feels like authentic to how you want to go about your own research. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. Thank you. Um, do we have any any other questions from the chat? Um, if not, um, I believe we can we can stop the recording. Uh, yeah. Okay. The recording has stopped. <laughs>